come up here since some people don't hear me quite so well while I'm down there. <laughs> so, uh, absolute blessing. You guys know we set a little bit of a stretch goal for 30 men to be signed up to go with us on our trip. Uh, we have 29 men who have signed up, so absolutely amazing. For those of you who are signed up and are going with us, it is this coming Saturday. Make sure you know it's this coming Saturday. Uh, we'll meet here at the church at 5.15 a.m. and leave at 5.30 a.m. And we'll have a wonderful day. And uh, just ask that everybody be in uh, uh, prayer for us, uh, for all those who are going to be traveling in uh, for this. There will be several thousand men that are there. And just pray for God's blessing on it and that uh, he is glorified through this. So thank you, guys. Oh, did you want to all just announce this children's church will start? next week also jump start starts next week okay fish fry um, if you haven't picked up a flyer to take somewhere to advertise uh, two weeks from today our, our fundraiser will be over <laughs> so let's uh, let's get started on uh, making sure everybody knows you know our newspaper is mostly online now so everybody doesn't see that so we need to get the word out that we are having our whole fish fry this year fish fry our country store live auction the whole thing so if you need to take one of these pick them up take it to your workplace or whatever or just tell people so they'll know um, and then we need pies pies and pies so um, everybody gets a piece of pie or sometimes they get two so we need a lot of pies. So if you want to start making those ahead of time and freeze them for that, um, we just need a lot of pies. <laughs> Do what, Lisa? <laughs> oh yeah, or you can buy it. <laughs> Marie Calendar, Lisa likes those. So, uh, And then if you want to help that day, uh, you can talk in the kitchen area if you want to be a server, talk with Tammy or Barbara. And they can set you up and see if they need any more help. Um, that day, we'll be at the church all day. So setting up and getting ready. So if you want to help, just show up. We can always find something for you to do. Uh, we will have people that need to be at the country store, people that need to help with the live auction, the silent auction. Um, John and, and Corinne take care of a lot of that. So And Tina, so they pretty much, you have to talk to them about that. Um, but anyway, we're hoping for a great day. Um, we want to make sure that what we do as a fellowship for our church, it's just a great time for us to work together and draw closer together. And it's a fun time. It's a lot of work. But um, we've been blessed with a, a wonderful um, time for that for many years. I think it will be 19 years this year that we've done it. Um, so we want to continue to keep this up because it glorifies God because of the work we do, and the good deeds that we do not keep our, the money for ourselves. We give all that money away. So... Um, we want to make sure that everything we do, we glorify him. So we've got to be in a good mind about it. Nobody gets mad. Nobody gets upset. We just go along and work and do whatever. So remember that. September 18th. The 18th is Saturday? Saturday. Okay. Hey, we don't want to hear about that. Yes, I heard Tebbets is having their dinner on the 18th. <laughs> Might be, Might be. You're right. But is theirs at night or during the day? Thursday. Day. day. Gotcha. All right. Well, yeah, you can eat out all day long that day. Then. I think it's drive through anyway. Do what? I think Tebbets is a drive through. Oh, it's only a drive through. Okay. Well, it's on Mark T yesterday. Hmm. Okay. Okay. We're well, enough about Tebbets. Let's move along. <laughs> We hope they have a good turnout, too. Uh, is there any other announcements? Okay. Um, there is not going to be anyone in the nursery during this service. If you were planning on taking um, a child in there, just let us know. Somebody will go in there and, and be there. We have a thank you card. <clears throat> Hansbury Christian Church, thank you so much for all you did for Ken's funeral. It was a nice day, and thanks for the dinner. Everything was very nice. God bless the Ken Dillon family. I think that's all I have. I guess we're great. Meet and greet.
up now. The candle. So as we talk about our theme this morning, the theme for this morning is actually a little bit interesting. So uh, we're in a new month, which means uh, we've talked about being Bible-based, we've talked about being discipleship-driven. This month we'll talk about being mission-minded, and lo and behold, how fitting that is. Uh, so we have our mission fundraiser coming up. But today's passage is an interesting one for our theme. So it's in Acts 14, and it starts in verse 8. And Lonnie, uh, I'll, I'll take care of flipping on it from here. All right? Now at Lystra... There was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. You know, a wonderful story to start. Paul saw this man who was crippled, who was injured, who couldn't walk, and he healed him right there. But that's not what we're focusing on this week. So then when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowd. Okay, so we're talking about being mission-minded, but what I want you to understand is that the people that we are trying to reach will often misinterpret what we're trying to share with them. Paul had gone in and done this wonderful work in the name of God, but because these people were pagans and paganism was all they knew, they reacted as pagans do. They thought, oh, this must be, this must be Zeus and Hermes, and they started to try to worship the men. Okay, sometimes... In fact, oftentimes, if you go to spread the gospel to people, they're not just going to immediately get it and, and have perfect theology right away. Oftentimes, things are going to be misinterpreted. It's going to feel like you're missing the mark. But, but what I want to say about that is that you don't need, you're not in control of the results, and God doesn't hold you accountable for the results. God holds you accountable for your faithfulness. Okay, Paul, you know, Paul and Barnabas, they didn't receive worship. They didn't say, yeah, we are actually these gods. No, they continued to point the people to God. But what I'm getting at, and I'm stumbling my way there, is that you focus on representing Christ and what you say and do. And don't get discouraged if people don't get it right away. So many people invested in me when I was a child. And I, <laughs> things either went in one ear and out the other or just bounced off my forehead and went back out. A lot of things didn't click, but when they did finally click, all of that effort that people had put into me for those years and years finally made sense. Don't get discouraged if people don't get it right away. Don't get discouraged if people don't respond when you share your faith how you expect them to respond. Uh, let's head into our prayer time and uh, start out with praises. Anybody have any praises to share? Yes. Yeah, I heard he had his kidney removed, and uh, yeah, so this is a 10-month-old little boy, you know, uh, just very challenging situation, but good news there, but continue to keep him in your prayers and his family in your prayers. Any other praises? Yes, Aaron. Yeah, we're glad to have you guys here today. Man, you got a lot of attention on it. Hey, I'm going to tell you a, a quick little story here. There was a time that I went to a church, 
And it was my first Sunday at a church, and the pastor had me come up and introduce myself to everyone from the front of the church. I'm not going to make you do that, but you already had to come up here for your birthday and, and all that <laughs> stuff. So we're glad to have you guys here. Uh, any other praises? All right. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, thank God for the rain. Amen. Yes. Good. Well, praise God for that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Any praises? I yes. Pray. I praise God that His intent is to have a relationship with me where I'm at. Amen. Not where I am, but Amen. Where I am. Praise God. You know, well, that that leads into the sermon, but we, yeah. <laughs> praise God. All right. I'll give you guys a baby update. Uh, Hezekiah is doing very well. He's getting louder and uh, producing a lot more things that have to be cleaned up. Uh, but it's all been a very good blessing. Kelsey's doing well. If anyone's friends with her on Facebook, you would have seen he's all smiles this morning. Uh, she did confirm, unfortunately, that those were gas-related smiles this morning. But he is just as cute as can be and has been such a blessing and has been teaching us a lot about life and love already. Um, and hopefully, uh, Lord willing, he will be here with us next week. So he'll be about six weeks old, so we'll feel safe about starting to get him out. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Uh, prayer requests. So I'm sure uh, most, if not all of you, have heard, unfortunately, about uh, Marge Henry's passing uh, late this week. Uh, please keep Harold in your prayers and Jill in your prayers, the rest of the family in your prayers. Uh, the funeral, visitation and funeral are going to be Friday. As of right now, uh, scheduled for Friday at 10 a.m. will be visitation. 12 o'clock will be the funeral service. We'll have a great side service that everyone's welcome to uh, join us at as well to follow and then a dinner here at the church. Uh, Barbara's setting up that dinner and has asked if people would help bring side dishes and desserts. The church always does such a great job at that. So if you could bring side dishes and desserts to help with that, we would really appreciate it. And I would say have them at the church by about, uh, what would you say, 1130 or so? She, she came to early service, or she's right there. Eleven thirty or so. Yeah, start bringing those there. Yeah, yeah, and so we'll, yeah, and so we'll be here for that service as well. And and those details we'll also share out over social media, and we'll make a phone blast. We'll have a call out so that we can make sure that everybody's able to come and pay their respects to Marge because she. Such a wonderful woman and, you know, uh, did so much in this church, too. So, other prayer requests? Yeah, yeah, ongoing issues with emphysema and, yep, yes. All right, your brother-in-law, just say his name is Boyd? Boyd House, all right. Uh, knee surgery on Wednesday, all right. Yes. Any others? Oh, yes. My dad's having a heart issue right now, and he's going to the hospital for another week with blood clots. Yeah, so just hope for a good report there, and everything's going well. All right, let's bow our heads together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to this place in thanksgiving, oh God, for you are good. Dear God, beneath everything else and above everything else, surrounding everything, is the knowledge that you are indeed good, and we praise you for that. Dear God, we praise you for this wonderful weather we're having today. Thank you, O oh God, for the much-needed rain, uh, and thank you, dear God, for the opportunity to come into this place together, to fellowship with one another, to sing praises, O oh God, to hear from your word. Dear God, we also come to you in a time of grieving, in a time of mourning, uh, for the loss of a loved one. Dear God, uh, 
please comfort us as we mourn. Be with, be with those who need you most at this time in that. Dear God, be with those who have ongoing issues with their health. Dear God, or even new issues that come up with, with cancer, with sickness, with injury, with surgery, with all of these different things that are mentioned. Dear God, I ask that you meet these needs and you do so in such a way that brings your name glory, honor, and praise. Dear God, I ask that you be with our church today as we seek to glorify your name, dear God, and that you transform us by renewing our minds, that we might understand you, that we might draw closer to you, and that you might uh, spread your gospel through us. I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I normally choose a passage of scripture, but this morning I would just like to read several verses that speak about who God is. I'm going to start with Deuteronomy 10:17. It says, "For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God." Psalm 147:5 says, "Great is our Lord and mighty in power; his understanding has no limit." Zephaniah 3:17 the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. Psalm 145.3, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Psalm 95.3, for the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. Jeremiah 10.12, it is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, by his understanding stretched out the heavens. Exodus 15, 6, your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. 2 Samuel 7, 22, therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you and there is no God beside you. And then I want to go to Psalm 96, 4. It says, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Will you stand with me as we open our service today with what a mighty God we serve. to just raise our voices in worship to him. And when I was preparing for this week, I couldn't help thinking, you know, tomorrow is Labor Day. And it's a time where our country kind of sets aside to rest because we all work so hard. Um, and it kind of went through my mind that our job as Christians never ends. God gives us a day of rest. That's today. You know, that we can spend time in fellowship with each other and with him to renew ourselves but our battle never ends. We are here fighting an enemy for a victory, and we need to always keep that forefront in our minds. Sing with me now, Onward Christian Soldiers.
continue our worship this morning with standing on the promises. Because standing on the promises are our best way to keep moving forward, isn't it? When we take hold of what he's given us in his word and we put the victory in his hands, nothing's impossible. stood out to me that um, this, the, the verse of this is he giveth and he giveth and he giveth again. You know, our efforts sometimes seem really small um, compared to what he can do through us. Um, but he continues, you know, even in our weaknesses, he continues and his grace is sufficient for everything that we face in this life. So as we come to this time of offering and we offer what back to him what he's given to us, um, let it be forefront in your mind how gracious a God he is, how he is there for every trial we face, every joy that we face, everything in our life. He's standing there beside us, and he keeps giving out of the love that he has for us.
for your boundless grace and the mercy that you give to us each day. We stop at this time in our service just to give our offerings to you and to remember um, how much you bless us. And Lord, help us to each day be mindful of the gifts that you give to us. And as we give back but the small portion, we pray that you will use it for the furthering of your kingdom and for your glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Cody, we have a request. I don't know if we have time for this, but we, <laughs> we had a request this morning um, for Becky and myself to sing I've Got a Mansion or mansion over the hilltop, however you know it. Yeah. Becky, you're looking at me like you didn't know we were going to do it this morning. Will you bring, will you bring your red book and we'll see if we can pull this off. With God's help, I know we can. Amen. I think I know it. <laughs> I guarantee you, I don't know all. I knew, I knew the verse for sure, or the chorus for sure, but I guarantee you I don't know it. Turn once again to the book of Judges, chapter 11. So, uh, to bring us all up to speed, whether you've been attending faithfully or not, we've been in a few different directions the past few weeks. So, 
Judges 10, what happened was the Israelites were serving idols, as, as they often found themselves doing. And so God sent the Philistines and the Ammonites to persecute them. And so Israel called out to God to save them. And what did God originally say? He said no, which is surprising, right? You expect, oh, reading the Bible, hey, yeah, they call out to God. God's going to save them. Things are going to be great. No, God said no. He said, you know what? You've been serving these idols. Turn to the idols and go ask them to save you. And so they then realized the error of their ways. They put away their idols. They stopped worshiping the idols. And then they call out to God. And it said the Lord pitied them. But I've told you uh, before that the book of Judges in many ways represents a downward spiral for Israel. Okay, this chapter is going to continue to show us that. We'll probably take at least two, if not three weeks to uh, cover this chapter. But before we even jump in, let's consider a concept from last week's message. Okay, salvation is salvation. All right, if someone puts their faith in Jesus Christ at a young age, serves him faithfully throughout their entire life, they will go to heaven. If someone lives like the devil for 99% of their life, repents on their deathbed, and puts their faith in Jesus, they will also go to heaven. And it will be the exact same heaven. But salvation has value in the here and now. The person who puts their faith in Jesus at a young age and serves him faithfully was likely a blessing to everyone he or she comes into contact with. Whereas the person who lived like the devil was likely a burden to everyone he or she came into contact with. Godliness has value in the here and now. Salvation has value in the here and now. Holiness has value in the here and now. And likewise, wickedness has consequences in the here and now. The latter of which we're going to see towards the end of this chapter. But if we look at verse 1, it says, Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you give us understanding as we cover this passage today. Dear God, that you use this to transform us, O oh God, that you make us aware of things in our own lives that, that need to change, need to be surrendered to you, dear God, and that you also give us the courage and the strength to go out and fight these battles that you've given us to fight. I ask this in the excellent name of Jesus. Amen. Now understand this. Jephthah is the next judge of Israel we're going to be talking about, and, and his description here just in verse 1 is interesting. He's a mighty warrior, first of all. That's a positive thing. But he was the son of a prostitute. Now, no amount of repentance was going to change the fact that he was the son of a prostitute. He was an unintended consequence of his father's sexual immorality. Does this mean that Jephthah was somehow cursed or irredeemable? Of course not. Of course not. But he was undoubtedly going to face a harder life and develop some scars because of his circumstances. Even if Jephthah was perfect, there was going to be a stigma against him because his mom was a prostitute. In fact, let's make things even worse. Verse 2, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. So not only did this man sleep with a prostitute, but he cheated on his wife in doing so. And his wife had sons as well. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. The first of these consequences would have been the rejection of his half-brothers. You know, the, the text tells us that they didn't want to share their inheritance with Jephthah, but I highly doubt that that's the only issue. You see, if your father had cheated on your mother with a prostitute... Do you think you would have some hard feelings towards him? Do you think, you think you'd have some hard feelings towards her? Do you think you'd have some hard feelings towards the child? Did Jephthah do anything to cause those hard feelings? No, he was born in those circumstances. He couldn't do anything about it. But do you think it had an effect on him? Absolutely, of course. Okay, so let's continue on. Verse 3. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. So Jephthah went to live in the land of Tob, a land famous for, anybody know what it's famous for? Absolutely nothing. In fact, this is the only <laughs> biblical reference of any such place. So it likely wasn't a great place, it wasn't a renowned place, and it, it likely wasn't even a place that lasted a long time because we don't see any reference to it in the Bible or really even outside of the Bible other than right here in this passage. 
It was a worthless place, and he was surrounded by worthless fellows. In fact, when the Bible uses that phrase, worthless fellows, what they're talking about are outlaws or bandits. So let me ask you this. Uh, first of all, why do you think Jephthah surrounded himself with these people? These are probably the only people who would interact with him. He's the son of a prostitute who's been rejected by his own family and had to go leave town. And so these are the only people who are willing probably to spend time with him. But also he's a mighty warrior. And so mighty warriors can uh, collect others who will fight with them. But let me ask you this. What sort of influence do you think these worthless fellows had on Jephthah? Morally, probably not a good one, right? Worthless fellows imply that they probably didn't care about the law. They probably didn't really care about God. But let me ask you, do you think they could have had any sort of positive influence on Jephthah, especially when it comes to becoming a mighty warrior. Anybody ever watched the movie The Count of Monte Cristo? A uh, classic movie. Actually, I'll, I have to tell myself, I haven't watched the original, but there was a remake back in the early 2000s, and I watched that one. And I remember seeing this man, he gets betrayed, he gets sent to prison, he flees prison and has to swim to safety, and of course, the people who he runs into are a group of bandits, and he has to fight for his life immediately. You know, they're going to either kill him or kill this other guy. Well, he wins. I don't want to ruin the whole movie for you. But basically, they end up teaching this man a lot of skills. Likewise, if you like the movie The Princess Bride, I love that movie. I know not necessarily everyone does. You know, as Wesley goes away and he comes back, well, when he's come back, some things have changed about him. But the dread pirate Roberts taught him how to sword fight and taught him all sorts of things. These worthless fellows that surrounded Jephthah likely had a uh, negative moral influence on him, but they were likely also part of what made him a mighty warrior. If you've been in a tough neighborhood at all, you, you understand that you have to become tough. So likely Jephthah had become hardened and, and toughened up by his time away from home. There were undoubtedly likely more negative consequences of his upbringing and negative effects on him, but some way or another he became a mighty warrior. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. So Israel ends up at war with the Ammonites, and this is a continuation of the story that had been happening in chapter 10. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. Now, all of a sudden, the elders of Gilead, keep in mind, this was Jephthah's relatives, okay, the town of Gilead, that was his father's name, so this was likely his father's village. Jephthah's partial relatives want Jephthah's help now. When he was a threat to take their inheritance, get him out of here. When he has potential to deliver them from their enemies, hey, bring him back. That guy might be useful. So they go to him and they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. So I just want you to put yourself in Jephthah's shoes here for a second. How would you, don't answer me out loud, how would you respond to this request? These men had chased you out and said, you're not going to inherit our, from our father here. You need to get out of here because you were born of another woman. They chase you out. They hate you. They get rid of you. And now they come back and say, hey, come back and be our leader and fight for us. How do you think you would respond? I put myself through this exercise and I came up with four lines of thought that could have run through his mind and perhaps you might have some more along with that the first one would be let him die you guys chose to do this you chased me off figure it out yourselves don't come and ask me for help second one would have been to say i'm going to save them because they're still my family even if they hate me the third and this is sort of related this is a chance for redemption this is a chance for me to make a name for myself and to redeem my name, that I would not be known as the son of a prostitute, but that I would be known as a redeemer or a savior of Israel. And the fourth would be that this is a trick. His brothers are going to turn on him. As soon as they get deliverance, they're going to cast him out once again. So thinking of all of those things, look at Jephthah's response. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you were in distress? So before he agrees or rejects their offer, Jephthah calls them out for their hypocrisy. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we turn to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. They admit they're only coming to him because they're of their distress. Now let me ask you this. Uh, how would that make you feel? You know, I'm not, I'm not always in touch with my feelings, but 
But if you say to them, hey, why do you want me to do this if you guys hate me and all of that stuff? And they say, well, yeah, it's because we're in distress. We really, really need help. Oh, so you still hate me. You just, you're desperate. You know, how would that make you feel? Probably be pretty angry. Uh, anyways, let's, let's continue the story here. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. He agrees to be their leader. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. So the elders of Gilead, they even bring God's name into this to show that basically we're not going to turn on you. We're not going to go back on your word. If you do as you say, we will uh, let you be our leader for the rest of your life. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. So Jephthah, the son of a prostitute, the companion of outlaws and bandits, is now placed as the ruler of the Gileadites. Now there's a lot more to this story that we're going to cover over the course of the next couple weeks. In fact, uh, this passage, one passage in here, was one of the... Uh, most impactful on me when I was originally a youth pastor. Uh, because you're going to have, you know, just spoilers, uh, you're going to have an example of human sacrifice towards the end of this chapter. Does God delight in human sacrifice? Yeah. No, he doesn't want any part of human sacrifice. But you're going to see, and I had a kid, this kid, he was, he was already struggling with a lot of stuff, and he was an atheist, and he was an atheist who came to youth group. He was in middle school, okay? Figure that one out. He didn't believe in God, but he wanted to come to youth group. All right? So he would always ask me all sorts of questions. And, and I was a novice at the time, and he would said, now why does God want human sacrifice? I said, like, God doesn't want human sacrifice. And he took me to this passage and said, yes, he does. What? And I hadn't even read it. God doesn't want human sacrifice. We need to properly understand this passage, but that's why we're going to take a few weeks to go through it. But today... I want us to observe something that we've talked about before, the, the topic of typology. Because there's some interesting typology to be found in Jephthah. Because Jephthah, like so many others, points us towards Jesus. But as, an, as important as it is to understand that, it's also important to understand the limits of typology. All right? Jephthah is not Jesus. Jephthah has some very bad moral shortcomings. Every other type of Christ has very bad moral shortcomings. The goal of typology, as I've told you before, is that throughout the Old Testament, there are these pillars of virtue, these characters who do wonderful things that are supposed to point us towards Jesus. All the characters in the Old Testament have a fatal flaw. They all have something that gets in their way. Even Moses, you know, even Abraham was a coward and told the Egyptians and, and some others that his wife was actually his sister. You know, all of them have flaws, whereas Jesus doesn't have those flaws. So these are all meant to be examples pointing us towards the guy who is going to come in and be the perfect example, which is Christ. But let's consider this morning the connection between Jephthah and Jesus. And let's start by considering their births. That might sound like an interesting place to start. Because Jephthah was the son of Gilead, and he was born of a prostitute. Jesus was the son of God, and he was born through Mary. That might not sound too similar, but you need to know that people in the time of Mary were very similar to people now. We affirm and believe that Jesus was indeed born of the Virgin Mary. However, the people of her time accused her of being a harlot. John 8, 48 says, The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? What's a Samaritan? What? They were, they were the opposites. Who were the Samaritans in the Bible? They were partially Jewish, and they were partially Gentile. They were the Israelites who had decided, you know what, we're going to blend in with the world around us and interbreed with the world around them. Well, Mary was Jewish, and there was no doubt that Jesus was born of Mary. So to accuse him of being a Samaritan... What are they accusing his mom of? Cheating on Joseph, getting pregnant by someone else, playing the harlot. Now, you know, uh, like I said, we affirm that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. But once again, as I said, people like then are similar to people now. If someone came to you today and said they were, you know, they were, there was immaculate conception that they were a virgin who was with child, you'd have some skepticism, Right? Jesus had to deal with that skepticism, not just as a time as a baby, 
But he had to deal with that throughout his whole life. In fact, there was a rumor that developed during Jesus' life that Mary had cheated on Joseph with a Roman soldier. And that he was conceived out of wedlock with, you know, once again, with a Roman. He was accused, basically, of his mother being a harlot. Jephthah was originally rejected by his family. His brothers chased him off, but so was Jesus. In Mark 3, it says, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. Jesus' own family early on thought he was crazy. When he first started ministering, they thought, oh, what, what is he trying to do? He's bringing too much attention to himself. He's going to get himself killed. we gotta, we got to bring him in. They were going to go and basically seize, arrest him and sort of lock him up for a little bit until he got back in his right mind. Later in the passage, and we've quoted this one. This was our theme a couple weeks ago, or maybe last week. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent and called him, sent him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Jesus was causing a stir. He was rejected originally by his family. How many of you, you know, you know that Jesus didn't stay rejected by his family? If you look towards the end of the Bible, you'll find a book by the name of Jude. Okay, who wrote the book of Jude? Well, a man named Jude, who was a half-brother of Jesus, was the son of Mary. Okay, what about the book of James? Written by a man named James, who was son of Mary, half-brother of Jesus. Eventually they received him, like eventually we see with Jephthah. But originally, Jephthah was rejected by his family, and so was Jesus. But Jesus was also rejected not just by his immediate family, but by the rest of his brothers, if we use the term more loosely to describe the Israelites. Uh, next up, Jephthah was joined by worthless fellows. So was Jesus. Matthew 10, 1 through 4. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Let's talk about these men. We, we know a little bit more about these men. What was their profession? Okay, now is it worthless to be a fisherman? No, but is it high society? Would it have been high society at the time to be a fisherman? No, it was a dirty job. It was a smelly job. You know, it obviously needed to be done, but this was a lower class level of work. And in fact, is there anything else you know about these men? They were uneducated. What was the nickname for uh, James and John? The Sons of Thunder. Which that sounds pretty cool. Except what basically Jesus was saying about them is that they make a whole lot of noise. All right? They're loud mouths. And we know Peter was a loud mouth as well. These guys were likely not welcome in a lot of social circles because they were too obnoxious. But it doesn't just stop there. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. What do you know about tax collectors? Everybody hated the tax collectors. What do you think about tax collectors today? Don't no, have to say it out loud. I'm not always a fan of tax collectors. When I see the little assessment truck driving around, it's like, oh, what are you guys doing here? And you know, I get angry and, and yada yada yada. Tax collectors are not very popular and have never been very popular. All right? They were rejected by the Jews because they weren't collecting taxes for Israel. They were collecting taxes for Rome. So an Israelite who became a tax collector was like a double trader. First, you're trying to take my money. And second, you're trying to take my money and give it to the Romans. Okay? So they were not liked. Uh, we don't, I don't know as much about Philip, Bartholomew, these sort of men. But there's one other that I want to talk about. Simon the Zealot. And, and not to mention Judas Iscariot, which we all know who Judas turns out to be. But Simon the Zealot, that's an interesting... Uh, title there. What's a zealot? What does the word zeal mean? Passionate. Yeah, very passionate. In fact, our word jealous actually comes from the word zealous. It, it's having a lot of passion or a lot of uh, fire towards something, but at this time, the zealots were actually a political party. Or you might call them a terrorist organization, actually, in Israel at the time. Uh, the town of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, fell in AD 70, in large part because of the work of a group called the Zealots. They would, they would assassinate a lot of Roman soldiers. They were a guerrilla warfare type of group that went around, and they were trying to get the Romans out and restore Israel in person. Well, Simon, before he met Jesus, was apparently a member of the Zealot Party. He was a revolutionary, an insurrectionist, a bandit. 
Someone who was likely a very violent man. And yet Jesus chose to surround himself with people like this. With a zealot, with tax collectors, with sinners, with loudmouthed fishermen. This is all very, very interesting, and we'll, we'll get to the punchline of why it's so interesting here in a little bit. But, let's consider the continuation of this typology here. In a time of need, when the enemy was too great, the Israelites put away their idols and called upon Jephthah. They called upon God, and God went to call for Jephthah, putting their faith in him to deliver them. That same thing is one day going to happen with Jesus. That hasn't happened yet. Right now, if you were to go to the uh, nation of Israel, has anyone taken a trip to Israel? I haven't been there yet. I would like to go, but at the same time, I don't want to go. Okay. The nation of Israel right now, do you know the largest gay pride parade in the world is held in Tel Aviv, Israel? Do you know if you were to go to Jerusalem, if you were to go to try to go on a Holy Land tour, do you know how, how touristy of a place it is? Where you could be sold, you know, a thousand different things. Oh, we'll give you a piece of the manger that Jesus was laid in as a baby. Oh, we'll give you a piece of the cross. Oh, we'll give you a piece. You know, there are a lot, it's a big salesman place just like it was during the time of Jesus. The nation of Israel, God, God wants the best for Israel, but the nation of Israel right now is not a godly nation. It's a nation of paganism where you can worship all sorts of different gods. You can do basically whatever you want in a lot of different ways. But one of these days, Israel is going to face such a great enemy that the United States won't be enough help for them. You know, right now, we're their strongest ally by far, and so usually, if people try to march against Israel, try to do anything, we can sort of discourage that. But you guys know, eventually, the United States is going to turn their back on Israel, right? right? It's prophetic. I mean, it's written. It's going to happen. In fact, back in my hometown, there's a, there's a pastor there who wrote a book, and he, you know, I, I mean no real disrespect to him on this, but he wrote a book about how he had this vision, basically, that America was going to betray Israel. And, like, he wrote it down like it was new information. It was like, buddy, come on, you should already know that. You're like, of course they are. This is nothing new. This has been, you know, all nations are going to turn their back on Israel eventually. Okay, they're going to be left with no allies. They're going to be left with no help. And when they get to that point, what are they going to do? They're going to cry out. In fact, Zechariah talks about this. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me... On him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. When they reach the end of all of their help, when they have no one else that they can turn to, then they will finally put away all their idols and look to God who has just been waiting for them to do this this entire time. And then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. The prophecy goes much further into it where he will literally, Jesus is going to descend onto the Mount of Olives and the mountain is going to split in half and all sorts of wonderful stuff. But basically understanding the typology here, just as when they were at their wits end, they were willing to go to a man that they had rejected and chased out of town, so Israel one of these days is going to go to the man that they chased out of town and crucified. They're going to look on him whom they pierce, and they're going to mourn, and they're going to say, save us, O God, and Jesus is going to come back, and indeed he's going to deliver them from all of their enemies, and not just them, but all those who have called on his name. But, but studying this, you know, understanding these connections can just be sort of vain knowledge if we don't do anything with it, all right? Because here's a big difference that's really important to us. You need to understand that much of Jephthah's life was not his choice. He did not choose to be born of a prostitute. He did not choose who he, how he was conceived, the nature of that. He did, not con, he did not choose who he was born to. And he didn't do anything himself for his brothers to hate him. He was surrounded by worthless men because those were likely the only people who were willing to associate themselves with him. Jephthah did not choose the hand he was dealt. The big difference is Jesus did. Think about that. Jesus chose the life that he lived. If you could pick your life, here's what you would probably pick. Here's what I would pick. I want to have very few problems. I want to have plenty of money. I want to not have any health issues. I want it to be nice and peaceable, you know, a nice uh, uh, family structure that, that's nice and simple. And I'd probably just go farm alpacas somewhere. You know, have my little alpaca farm, 
take care of those cute animals, have about 70,000 dogs as well, all golden retrievers. I mean, it would just be a nice, simple, easy life. And yet the God of the universe, when he chose to come to earth as man, chose to be born of a virgin who would then be accused of being a harlot. He chose to be born into a family that his own brothers would reject him originally. He chose to come to a people that would reject him. He chose to die naked and alone on a cross next to two criminals. He chose to choose an apostle who would betray him named Judas. He chose to choose another apostle who would deny him three times the night of his execution. You know, he chose all of these things. Why in the world would the God of the universe choose to put himself through a life like that? He could have lived a relatively easy life before dying on the cross, but he chose to go through the insults, the humiliations, the difficulties, betrayals, and rejection. Why in the world would he do that? Yeah, yeah those are both right. Those are very simple in some ways, but it's very impactful if you ask me. The book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Let's look at those verses one more time here. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. God is all-powerful. Do you think that God the Father, when he created the heavens and the earth and all, everything in them, do you think that he knew what it was like to be weak? Do you think weakness could ever be a word that's used to describe an all-powerful God? No, and so Jesus left the glory of heaven above to come down to the earth to be weak, to truly understand weakness. Now, we could say he was still God in that, and yes, he indeed was, but he chose to go 40 days without food, simply to know what it was like so that he could understand you. He chose to go through every single temptation simply so he could know what it was like to understand what you go through when you go through those things. Jesus willingly put himself through all of that, not even just the death on the cross, but his life leading up to that, simply to understand you where you are. As Sally mentioned earlier in the service, she praises God that he meets her where she is, and I praise God for that as well. It's easy to praise God when your life is going in a cookie-cutter fashion, when everything is working and it's all great, but what about when you are downtrodden? What about when you are legitimately hurting and at your wit's end? How easy is it to praise God then? Not so easy if you think he's far away. Not so easy if you think he doesn't understand you, if he's just, you know, perfect and he doesn't know what it's like to go through all these difficulties. But what about if you understand that he willingly chose to go through so many of these difficulties? So many of the world's religions try to make you prove yourself to a God. God knew before he created you that you wouldn't be able to prove yourself to him. How could any of us try to prove ourselves someone so perfect, someone so mighty, someone so great when we're so small? Rather than that, God chose to send his son to be weak. He chose to take someone who was not celebrated, that he wasn't, he had no stately form or majesty that we should be drawn to him, and to let him be a sacrifice for us, that he would then be risen from the dead and could be there to help us, who could sympathize with our weaknesses. I found over the past, you know, month and a half, parenthood has given me a lot of sympathy for other parents. You know, I could always, I could rationalize, you know, the difficulty of parenthood and say, you know, yeah, I realize I'm going to get less sleep and so it's going to be harder to do A, B, or C. But there's one thing to sort of think of that as an outsider and it's another thing to actually go through it. Because I can tell you when you're tired, even things that make sense don't make sense. All right? Because you're tired, ti you know, fatigue affects you. Jesus did not want to be distant from each one of us but chose to go through all these things. He was, in every respect, he has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. With Jephthah, with this story that we're going to continue in the next couple weeks, understand this. God didn't leave out the details in the text of, of his birth. 
He didn't try to cover those things up because they were too shameful and say, you know what? Yeah, no, they don't need to know that. They just need to know all the good things you do. So one of the beauties of the Bible is that it tells the entire story, warts and all. It doesn't try to cover up, you know, like many ancient myths do, where they just try to talk about the good things that the kings did and the great things people did. No, it tells you the entire story. Here's how this man was born. Here's how his family treated him. And then here's how they came back to him. Likewise, we need to understand God does not expect from you perfection. God expects transparency from you. He expects a willingness to draw near to him. He expects you to be open with him. That's what he desires for you. If I have ever come to God with an area of sin or struggle, I've never gotten a response of him of, well, that's just tough, you know. Yeah, you're just... I don't know what that's like. You're just going to have to deal with it yourself. No. Every single time I come to him and say, God, I am struggling with this, he's there to meet me. And he fixes it. It's not just instant where it's like, oh, hey, I don't have any problems. But no, but he truly, genuinely fixes my life on a day-to-day -day basis. Very small practical example from parenthood right here. I have control issues. I've known I've had control issues in the past, but my control issues were brought front and center when I realized that I could not put our baby down in the bassinet to sleep and close my eyes. Because what if something happened? What if he stopped breathing? I had to actively go to God and say, God, I am not going to get any sleep unless I learn to trust you. Help me to trust you. God, preserve this, my son's life. Make him, help him to be healthy. Help us to know when he's not so we can do something about it. Because there's nothing I can do to add a single breath to my son's life. And I had to realize, as much as I want to be in control, that I was not in control there. And God doesn't expect me to be in control of that. He's in control. He expects me to trust him. That's a small practical thing, but, but you'll find that, that it can apply to every single area of your life because there's nothing that's too big for God and there's nothing that's too small for God. Okay, keep that in mind. We... We're in a day where so much of preaching and so much of church is about these grandiose gestures where everything has to be so big. When I would go to youth camps growing up and they bring people to testify, it was always the people who would either just live the roughest lives where they had been in drug addiction, they had been, you know, a murderer, they had been, there was a, I heard a testimony of a guy who was a, an assassin for, for a mafia down in Central America who came to Christ. Like those are amazing stories, but it's not a relatable story to me at all. That's not my problems. <laughs> Likewise, we hear about people who go across the world. They go to Africa on a mission trip. They go to all of these wonderful places and do these amazing things. And those are great things and wonderful things. But once again, that's hardly relatable to my day-to-day -day life. You know, the thing is, the grace of Jesus applies to everything that you do. If you are a kid in school and you are struggling with math homework, you can pray to God to help you with math. Okay? Now, Austin, you're not allowed to struggle with math because your mom's your teacher now, so, so you told me that today. But, but no, it sounds silly, but understand that if you ask God to help you with a certain subject, he's not just going to digitally download the information in your head. He's going to teach you how to study. He's going to teach you how to learn. He's going to give you help, but that help might not always be the easiest way that you want it to be. But all of that comes down to trusting him. When you lose a loved one, as we've had a number of people in our church go through that, how do you prepare to lose a loved one? You can make all the arrangements you want, but it doesn't actually prepare you. Just as parenthood, we can make all the preparations, build the nursery, all that good stuff. It doesn't prepare you for when they're actually here. But God can. God can help you through it, through the most difficult times, whether good or bad. We have to learn to go with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. God is not ashamed of you and he is not afraid of you. He's not ashamed of the areas you've struggled with and he's not afraid of your weaknesses. He will take you as you are if you will simply come. Keep this in mind as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this example of Jephthah. Dear God, I know as, uh, that when we look forward in this, there are going to be some very sad things that we look at, for he made a really poor decision. But dear God, I thank you that his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
Dear God, as I was reading in Hebrews this week, I saw his name mentioned there as one of the heroes of faith, and, and that changed my perspective on Jephthah. I saw this man as a failure in many ways, and in some ways he was, but he was a failure that you love, just like we are failures that you love. Because we are not saved by our righteousness or our works, but we are saved by grace through faith in your Son. Dear God, I ask that you get rid of any fear that we have of drawing near to you. Because the blood of Jesus has paved the way for us to come to you with any and all weakness. That we don't have a high priest who can't relate to us, but, but we have Jesus of Nazareth who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Because he was tempted in every way without sin. Glorify your name through this church, O oh God. Equip us and empower us that we might testify to your goodness in the ways that you deliver us from our sins, O oh God. I ask in the mighty and powerful and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Will you stand as we sing our communion hymn, Near the Cross? Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before your table today, Lord, I just pray that our hearts are humbled, Lord, that we have set aside the strife in our life, that we look to you, Lord, for the answers that we need, for the sacrifice that was given on the cross, Lord, and the body that was broken, for those of us who are so undeserving of your love. Lord, you have a purpose for each and every one of us. If we will turn to you, Lord, to seek your guidance, to seek your way, and Lord, to never look back on the things that were. Lord, I just pray that you will give us that guidance, Lord, that we may go forward for you allow you to wash our sins away, Lord. And Father, God, with joy in our hearts as we stand before your altar, Heavenly Father, thanking you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our King. And Heavenly Father, as we partake, Heavenly Father, the emblems and the representation of your Son, 
And when we look at the tomb, Heavenly Father, we know that it is empty and that he is risen and that he is sitting at your right side, interceding on our behalf. Heavenly Father, we're grateful and thankful for the knowledge of knowing the one that died for our sins. We thank you, Father. It's through his name we pray. a lot about love today. Cody's message reminded us of the reasons why Jesus did what he did, because he loved us so much that he was willing to come here to give up everything that he knew so that we could one day be with him and his Father in heaven. And the best way we can show others amongst ourselves and amongst the world is to love them. Will you stand with me as we close our service with and they'll know we are Christians. As we close this morning, remember this, that, that I won't go through all the verses again, but sometimes when you try to witness to people, they won't get it right away, and that is okay. You know, there are so, if you think back to your own salvation, there were so many people who likely invested in you on the way that it didn't make sense at the time, but when the light finally shone through, 
It all clicked. Keep in mind, you might just be a part of the puzzle with what you're doing right now. Dear God, please be with his people as they go. Bless them, dear God, and make us all more like Jesus, O oh God, that we might fulfill this mission you've given us to go into all the world and preach your gospel, to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything you've commanded. I ask in the great name of Jesus, amen. Have a wonderful week.